We're looking at life through the beautiful metaphor of gardening or farming, if you will, and the acknowledgement that the river of grace, the endless supply that flows, as she was singing about, is the limitless supply of the creative source and force of energy that is manifesting itself as gardens and, and, and growth all around us, but also is similar to our life. That there's a limitless supply of good and of that which we would like to create in our life that we can tap into, but just like any good gardener, there are principles and, and more effective ways to tap into that creative force to have it work best for us in our lives. And so last week, we talked about the mir having a miracle grow consciousness and how we can use a product like miracle grow to cause our garden to thrive. And I suggested last week that there are qualities such as gratitude and faith and patience that we can apply to the garden of our living for the garden to grow and to thrive in our lives. And this week, as we explore the limitless supply, we're looking at meaning in the whole process and how to create the best possibilities. And what I mean by meaning in the whole process is that as I consider the, the activity of gardening or farming, a gardener or a farmer has to pay attention to the whole process. They can't just pay attention to what they're ultimately going to grow. Every part of the journey of the garden or of the, the food that's coming forth that they're growing is important from tilling the soil to even the fertilizer to tending to the things that grow in the garden that don't belong, that might choke out what, what really wants to flourish to uh, all sorts of processes and ways of watering and discipline and tending to things so that they can grow and thrive. And so there's meaning in the entire process, not just in the end result. And I think the same is true for each one of us, that every part along the journey of living our life every phase of life that we go through, every moment that we experience as we're either creating what we want or something's coming forth that we don't want, has meaning for us, has intentionality for us, has a gift for us if we are willing to embrace it fully. And then we're going to explore about the, the possibilities of planting consciously and conscientiously the life we would really love to live. And so the first question I'm inviting us to look at in this, this conversation is, what's your style? What is your style of life? There's a, a phrase that I both love and hate that always causes me to think, which is, how you do anything is how you do everything. I'm sure many of you have heard that before. And it, it causes me to step back and look at my life often and look at my style. And many times I think part of the conflict for us is that each one of us has a style or a way that works for us that we kind of set aside at times if we get too desperate about wanting to create something new. We don't use what works for us. We forget or we, we just don't pay attention to what works for us. And so what I've discovered about this being human thing is that every one of us has at least one place, if not more, where life just kind of flows easily. It's easy for us to be physically healthy or easy for us to be financially well. Uh, it's easy for us to find friendships and romantic relationships, or it's easy for us to find a job or move uh, in our career forward, or it's easy for us in our spiritual life. And we expect that what's easy for us is easy for everybody else, but it's just not true. Every person has places in life where for some reason or another, their mental equivalent, as, as many of the New Thought teachers would say, their ability to easily and effortlessly just take on the notion that this is an easy flowing part of life, maybe because someone demonstrated that to us as we were growing up, or there's something within us that just naturally flows in that direction. And conversely, I've noticed that just about every human being has at least one place where they tend to have their struggle. 
They make progress and they fall back. And they make progress and they fall back. And they make progress and they may not understand why. Why do I struggle in this area? I want to be like that other area of my life. I want it to flow easily. But this is part of the garden of living. Every gardener also has certain plants that it's easy for them to grow. They just somehow figure out and their roses or their petunias thrive, but their daffodils, oh, they struggle. And so every one of us has that. So first of all, we have to understand our style. And I would encourage us always when tapping into the limitless life, the limitless harvest that is seeking expression through us, to consider the places in life where it tends to be fairly easy and flowing. And what is it about that? Why is that? What do I bring to that part of my life that allows it to be that easy and flowing? And how could I take that same energy and apply it to that, par that place in my life where I might be struggling a little more? What in this part of the garden that works so well could I apply to this part of the garden that isn't going so great? And to question ourselves and to discover for ourselves some of that. Some of us also are like my wonderful friend Raz, Dr. Raz, who's here today. Hi, Dr. Raz. And Dr. Raz, he is a, an amazing planner. He's got things planned. Boom, 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 boom. He's very, I've watched him over and over and working with him in our life, how, how he just has a brain, a mind that can put together systems and put together things together in place. And then there's people like me that's sort of like, well, I'm going to grow some roses there and some more roses over here and then maybe some petunias over here and it's going to be beautiful. But Raz is as beautiful too because it's all planned beautiful. And then I think, well, I should be more like Raz. And then I realized, no, Raz should be more like Raz. Michelle should be like Michelle, right? That's how it goes. <laughs> and so it's the truth for each one of us too. We tend to compare ourselves to other people in our lives. Well, I should do it more like them. No, we have to find our style, our way that works for us and that helps us feel connected to our life and not try too hard. It's certainly we can learn. I've learned a lot from Raz's amazing planning, but I have, I can apply what I do, my style, and bring in some of that without making me wrong and still have a thriving garden. So when we, we pay attention to how we tend to do things and we apply some of that to the places that we would like to see thriving, we begin to discover our style of growing and we surrender more to the process. And this is really important, to have intention and surrender to the process all at the same time. What I've noticed about us human beings is that when life gets really hard or we struggle repeatedly in an area, we can get very desperate about wanting to create anew. And even those of us, I mentioned this a little bit last week, who have learned how to apply ourselves to one area of the garden, get angry with ourselves that we can't apply it there, and we get very desperate, and I want it now. And that reminds me of uh, the, the show uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory years ago. All the kids represented different moralistic ways of being that could be teachable, could teach us how to behave, and Veruca Salt, right? She was the bad egg. I want it now! And she sang that song about, I want the world, I want the whole world, and she wanted it now! And we can be like that, can't we? I want my garden to flourish, and I want it now! And we're, we're, we can be a bad egg like Veruca sometimes, if we're not careful, because that energy of doesn't really support us. And I know that it, it can be challenging to avoid that, especially in those places in life where suddenly things turn. Suddenly the garden turns bad. Suddenly my health uh, has an issue. Or suddenly someone I love is suffering. 
or suddenly I no longer have a job, or suddenly the world is changing in ways I don't like, or suddenly things are happening that scare me. And in that energy, even we who stand together as a community who can say we know how to use the creative energy of life to create our lives, we get a little desperate and a little bit Veruca-like. And we want life to change and we want it to change right now, for gosh sakes. And that doesn't support us. In the creative process and riding the wave of the limitless harvest, it does not support us to be Veruca-ish. It supports us to stand in that passion to say, I want to change here. And I know I can make a change here. And I'm going to have to work to make that change. And so then the next step is to generate the possibilities. To begin to generate possibilities for how I'm going to be in cooperation with the law of life that is always working through me to generate new possibilities. Just as if I were a gardener and I wanted to generate a whole new garden. I would never stand in front of the garden and scream and yell at the garden having just planted the seed and say, I want my, my roses now. I would never do that because I understand that I have to plant, I have to tend, I have to pay attention, I have to allow it to grow. And so all of us can stand in that place with our garden and generate possibilities. But what we have to do is pay attention to ourselves as we're generating those possibilities and challenge ourselves to continue to walk forward in the discipline that it takes to actually grow the results we'd like to grow. Many years ago, I was fortunate to become in, involved in a program with the great Mary Morrissey. And she had this five-year program called the Possibilities Program. And the first time I went to her program in Oregon, I got put into a group, all of us did. And they were, uh, the group that I was in was called my Possibilities Partners, Partners in Possibility. And we met together for five years to mastermind, to support each other, to help brainstorm and generate possibilities for each other when our lives got stuck. And we used the principles we were learning in Mary's seminars, and we worked together on the phone and on Skype, and when we could be together in person, we worked together in person, all within the context of this program. And it was an amazing, wonderful, generative time in my life. And I learned a lot about myself and about human beings when it comes to generating possibilities. That often we're full of good energy like, I want to generate new possibilities. And then uh, someone comes along and we even say to them, help me brainstorm about generating possibilities. And it's fascinating how someone will brainstorm a great idea and we'll go, oh no, that, that, that would never work. No, that, you can't do it that way. I could never do that. No, that's not going to work. And so it reminded me of the wonderful work of, of Richard Bach, one of my favorite authors who wrote the book Illusions. And out of that book, my favorite phrase is, argue for your limitations, and sure enough, they're yours. <laughs> Even when we are consciously saying, I want to generate new possibilities for my life, it's interesting to note how we will push away possibilities that come our way. Oh, I, I, I could never, no, I, I could, no, no, no. I really want to recreate that, but no, no, no. That's too much. That's too big. That's too, ooh, that. And so what we know is that we're going to have to, in the process of generating new possibilities and riding the wave of the limitless river of grace that's flowing through us, if we want to have a new experience, we're going to have to try new things. And so what, what helps often is to have 
partners in possibility in our lives. People that we are in groups with or classes with to be able to put prayer requests at like a church or something. Anybody hear anything about that ever? And let people pray for us and lift us up in possibility. Some people create affirmations and learn how to pray for themselves. And I also know that there's this stuff called the World Wide Web where if I wanted to be a master gardener of roses, I might have to go out and research well, how do people grow roses where I live? What does it take? What are some of the secrets to growing good roses? I might have to go meet with a master gardener who already has grown roses and say, how do I grow roses? Just like if I want to create a more financially abundant life, I might have to research how to do investing or how to save money or what does it really take or go find a mentor or someone who's living out the way I would like to live and then ask them to mentor me or at least show me what their secrets of success are. In other words, I might have to do the horrible, dastardly deed of allowing myself to be helped and supported. Oh my God. I noticed when I was in my possibility group, I would suffer sometimes under the delusion that in order to generate new possibilities, I'd have to do it all by myself or in secret so that no one would know what I was doing just in case I failed. But I also noticed that those of us who were the most successful at not only generating possibilities but actually having them come to fruition in the garden of our life did all that they reached out and let people know. They, they welcomed the brainstorms. They welcomed input. They sought out mentorship and partnership every chance they could. They were willing to be in community. Sometimes they created affirmations or vision boards or images of the things that they wanted to create because that worked for them. Again, finding what works for us to keep us focused and attuned and moving out beyond our ideas of the box we've been living in in that garden. This is part of how we generate great possibilities and grow what it is that we want to grow in our life. Then there's another element to this process that I think is very important, has, has showed itself in my life a number of times. It's a word that I'm cre I've created off of the word possibilities, but the word is, and I don't know how you're going to translate this, darling, surprise abilities. Let me see how she does that. Very good, very good. Okay, <laughs> surprise abilities. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed, but I've noticed that sometimes things show up in my life that surprise me. Now, often they're things that I don't really want. They're, su they're not pleasant surprises, but very often... They're also extremely pleasant surprises that I think, how did this come about? As I was reflecting upon this part of the garden, I realized that I say a lot of times uh, to people that I did not grow up as a young child thinking about all the things I could do with my life saying, I'm going to be a minister when I grow up. Never once had that thought. And of course, that thought had its way with me, rose up from this deep place within me when I was 18. But I also, in reflecting, can look back to a very challenging time in my life. I was very challenged in fourth, fifth, and sixth grade uh, around feeling uh, uh, like I didn't belong to the human race or to, to the grade that I was in, feeling uh, a cast out uh, being bullied every day. It was mostly around my body. Believe it or not, I'm, I am five foot four, and that's not very tall, but um, I got to be five foot four, I think in third or fourth grade maybe. So to the other kids, I was like a giant, and I was teased and bullied for being tall. And then one summer, I went away and came back, and, and everybody else was taller than me, and then I was teased for being short. I was teased for being busty. I was teased for being heavy. I was teased and made wrong for my hair or how I looked. And I know many of us went through this. But when I look back on my personal experience, I realized that 
as I got into fourth, fifth, sixth, and then seventh grade, the bullying and the feeling as though I didn't belong and something was wrong with me, that I was ugly and I didn't belong and that I wasn't acceptable, caused me to just sort of implode into myself. And I've never been a very introverted person, but what I found in seventh grade is that to avoid the teasing, to avoid the bullying, I just put my head down, I wouldn't look anybody in the eye, I had maybe one or two friends I would talk to, and I would just go to class. I would just go from one class to the next class, I wouldn't look at anybody, I wouldn't talk to anybody, I just was there to get my grades and get my homework and go home and get it all done because I just believed I did not belong and it was too painful to interact with people. It was too risky to interact with people. I hadn't found this teaching, but I had, a, well, I'd been kicked out of catechism at that point and uh, I was okay with that. I think that Catholicism is a beautiful tradition and there are many people who practice it and love it and it just wasn't a fit for me. It wasn't my tradition. So I felt some freedom and I was beginning with my mother's support to read some spiritual books. And I decided in that year, I remember making a conscious decision, it's gotta be different. And what's got to be different is me. I've got to be different. And I contemplated all summer, practically every day, how could I be different? What could I do different? And so when I went back to school in, seventh, in eighth grade, I made some conscious choices. First of all, I consciously chose to look at every person and greet them and smile at them, even if they called me a name. I consciously chose to start making friends because in, at that time in school and I think throughout high school too, there were little pockets of people that were different demographics. There were the theater geeks and the choir people and the choir geeks and the sports geeks and you know, everybody was a geek for some reason at that time. And so I decided I don't really know where I belong so I probably should make friends with every different group so I can make more friends and I can discover where I might actually belong. So I consciously set out to meet people and greet and, and be the extrovert that I am. And then I remember an announcement happened one day. And it was an announcement saying that, that students, eighth grade students were invited to run for election in our school. And they were seeking a new head boy and head girl. And I said, I'm going to I'm going to step in. And I was nervous. I was so nervous. I can even feel the nerves pouring through me now. I remember the nervous stomach. And I wrote my little speech. And, I, and they had a big school uh, thing where everybody in the school came. And all of us candidates were up front. And we all had to give a speech about why we wanted to, to be the lead in the school. And so I got up and I gave my speech. And I remember speaking and the kids were all quiet. Probably because they were thinking, what the heck is she gonna say? And because I could speak, and I was eloquent, and I captured their attention somehow. I didn't even know quite how. It was quite stunning to me. And when I gave, was done giving my speech, I got a standing ovation and they clapped and I left as we all did and they said, everybody go vote now. And I remember going into the girls' restroom and standing in front of the mirror and thinking, what just happened? What was that? I could feel something poured itself through me and I just was able to speak in front of people and I didn't know how. It was a surprise ability. It was something showing me some natural born part of the grace of the gifts that I bring to this planet. I didn't even know it then, but what I do know is that I won that election by a landslide. I was the head girl for eighth grade, yes. And my life changed forever in that school 
because I did become friends with lots of kids. And I did still endure some of the bullying, but I decided to set it aside and not let it keep me from being who I was and allowed that surprise ability to have its way with me from that point on, which led me into all sorts of experiences and eventually to this moment right now where I know that part of the garden of my life is some innate desire and ability to get up in front of people and remind them of their magnificence and say, come on, let's be the best version of ourselves. And some people actually listen to that and are willing to consider it. And that is awesome. It's a surprise ability that supported me and all of us have those. Those, those innate talents or gifts or things, we don't even know how they got here. Just like a garden might have something that suddenly grows that's a great surprise. I talked last week about my wonderful husband building that deck in front of our house. Well, this last summer, all of a sudden, this big, thick weed started to grow in front of the deck, and we didn't know what it was. And to his credit, he went and did some research and figured it out and came in one day and proudly said, somehow, we've got some sunflowers growing in our yard all of a sudden. And he loved watching the bees as they helped the flowers grow. And I love that little meme that talks about when many of us were kids, a bee would come around and be like, get away, get away. And now the bees come and we say, welcome, would you like a drink? Can we make you more comfortable? Because we know how important the bees are to our ecosystem. And so we had these beautiful flowers, surprise abilities. And it just reminds me, in our gardens, there are surprises. And when we allow ourselves to welcome them and flow with them and even give energy to them and recognize that everybody has innate gifts, talents, things that can be brought into the world to serve the joy of their own living and serve all human beings, then our gardens can all flourish and we all can sense and live from that limitless harvest. Our founder, Ernest Holmes, says to us so beautifully, the past is behind and whatever doubt it may have held is gone with it. The future is before, bright with prospects. The eternal sun of righteousness is ever ascending, never to descend. Let us look toward the high goal of lasting attainment, fearless and happy. Let us live in the present, looking neither backward in horror, no forward in apprehension, but looking into the present with joy, abiding in faith. Today, the meaning of the entire process unveils itself to all of us as we live out our best lives. Today, the possibilities that we cast for ourselves can be conscious and conscientious possibilities and can also be riding on the beautiful waves of the surprise abilities that show up. But I'm inviting us this week, and especially as we're heading into these final weeks of our calendar year, to live abiding in faith as we set ourselves up for this time of darkness in the skies as the sun is out less and less every day and prepare ourselves for the light that is about to be birthed on this planet through each one of us as each one of us. You and I are the limitless supply. Let's take it on and live it.